This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance Broadcast. A living faith in God can provide any person with the inner spiritual assurance needed to confront and conquer fear and anxiety and to live with an affirmative attitude of hope and courage. What has contemporary psychology learned about techniques for releasing pent-up human potentials? A series of important tests conducted by McGee and Crandall at Ohio State University dealt with what the researchers called locus of control. In studying 923 elementary, junior high, and high school students, it was found that some of the students held the attitude that their lives were predominantly controlled by external circumstances and events. They perceived themselves as having an external locus of control. They had come to the conclusion that they didn't have much choice about how their lives went, but that they were essentially the products or victims of circumstances. The other group of students had what the researchers termed an internal locus of control. They held to the idea that the primary determination of the outcome of their lives was interior in their own thinking, values, and decision-making. Not surprisingly, further research disclosed that the students whose philosophy and psychology centered on an internal locus of control were far more successful in problem-solving, academic studies, sports, and achievements of every sort than were the students with an external locus of control. The development of a positive and productive inner life is one of the most vitally important aspects of human existence. When Christ said, the kingdom of God is within you, he was simply emphasizing in spiritual terms that which contemporary psychology would portray as an inner locus of control. The individual aware that the living spirit of God indwells the mortal mind and that through prayer, meditation, worship, thinking and decision-making, he or she can reflect the wisdom and inspiration of that inner spirit onto the outer patterns of daily living. That is a person in touch with spiritual resources which are dynamically life-transforming. If you daily envision yourself as living a joyful life full of love for God and love for people, brimming with enthusiasm and zest, abounding in faith and courage as the son or daughter of God you were intended to be. That is precisely what your life will tend to express and become. According to your faith, said Jesus, so shall it be to you. I remember one morning I was buttoning my shirt and I began thinking about the fact that if you get the top button in the right buttonhole, all the rest of the buttons will naturally fall correspondingly in place across from all the right buttonholes. But if you happen to put the top button in the wrong buttonhole, then all the rest of the buttons are across from the wrong buttonholes all the way down the shirt. And similarly, if you get the top priorities of your human life right, if your spiritual and philosophic values and meanings are centered on the highest of truths and realities, the other aspects of life will then tend to fall into their proper places. If the higher things in your priorities are in order, such other matters as vocation, marriage, family, hobbies, recreation, and lifestyle will begin to arrange themselves in suitable order as well. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, said Jesus, and all other things will be added to you. Another fascinating principle of applied psychology is the Thomas Theorem named after Professor W.I. Thomas, who formulated it. And it goes, if you define a situation as real, it becomes real in its consequences. This principle is a two-edged sword and can be employed either positively or negatively. On the personal level, if you define yourself as worthless, you will begin to act and react and behave in your life as if you were worthless. You have defined a situation as real. It is becoming real in its consequences, in its effects upon your day-by-day -day existence. But if conversely, you define your situation differently, if you define or think of your life as that of a personality of God-given power and potential with momentous reasons for being alive on this earth, that God has a plan for this planet and a purpose for your individual existence, that definition will likewise begin to become real in its consequences, its effect on the way you live day by day. Another great principle in spiritual living is the practice of enthusiasm. That word enthusiasm is from the Greek en and theos, and it means literally God within 
or filled with God. The ancient Greek philosophers believed that enthusiasm was a spiritual power bestowed upon human beings to assist them in living more fulfilled lives. And there is great energy released by cultivating an enthusiastic attitude toward life. And the secret of it is faith in God, trust in God, permitting the power and purposes of God to energize your mind, your body, to energize you spiritually so that you begin to flow over, to spill over at the brim with the joy of existence, worshiping and loving God and loving others, a transformation of your consciousness, the way you think and feel and act and react. Think back over your own life, haven't some of your finest moments come when you were dealing with some difficulty and having to utilize your full resources in coping with some demanding situation, challenge and response. It is the story of progress throughout human history, and it is a principal functioning in the life of every truly outstanding man or woman who ever lived. They all learned to become challenged, inspired, and stimulated by difficulties rather than giving up and accepting a defeatist attitude or philosophy. There is a national law in France that the thousands of tons of waste plastic, metal, glass, paper, and rags thrown away and previously burned or buried must now be reclaimed and recycled in the manufacture of new products. The French reprocess scrap plastic, for example, into a variety of chemical products and even into gasoline for automobiles. A Reuters European Newswire article on the ecology movement in France was titled, Turning Garbage into Gold. The world is beginning to realize that there is enormous productive potential and an entire untapped economy in what civilization previously discarded as waste products, scrap, and junk. Environmental scientists and ecologists are truly teaching humankind how to turn garbage into gold. But that is not only possible ecologically. That is possible psychologically and spiritually in your life as well, whatever your problems may be. Whatever your difficulties, obstacles, frustrations, learn how to turn garbage into gold. The primary issue about garbage used to be how to get rid of it. The primary issue about garbage now is how to use it. That is likewise the best way to deal with the difficulties of life. Rather than thinking only of the elimination of problems, think also about the utilization of problems. In order to live really exuberantly, you not only have to learn to move obstacles, you must learn to let obstacles move you. That is, you must learn to let difficulties serve as stimuli to thoughts and actions, not as roadblocks. To discover the love and purposes of God is to make the supreme discovery of all of human life. It puts a new spring in your step and a new light in your eye. It imparts to you a new enthusiasm for existence. Develop and express a rational but well-balanced, real enthusiasm for existence. Refuse to be ashamed of your joy. Delight in it. The finding and knowing of the God of all this vast and star-sprinkled cosmos is very simply the greatest experience possible in all of human life. Nothing else can compare with it. Rejoice, give thanks, and worship this God who is the architect of time and space, the originator, the first thought of all reality. How few people have you ever met who really celebrated life itself as a gift of God? Celebrate the breath in your nostrils, the pulse at your wrist. In spite of all its troubles, this can be a wonderful life if you live it in a vital sense of daily companionship with the God of this universe, whose spirit indwells your mortal mind and can stimulate, inspire, and invigorate you to begin to live the way you've inwardly always wanted to live and the way the living God created and intended that you live, full of faith, love, joy, peace, power, and purpose as the son or daughter of God, infinitely beloved. You really are. In Mark 11, Jesus says these four tremendously powerful words. Have faith in God. Dare to believe that you are a child of God. Live in this faith. Lincoln said, let us have faith that right makes might. 
And Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes once said, it is faith in something which makes life really worth living. And that is true. Remember that faith is assuming some great truth and then acting on, living on the basis of that assumption, assimilating it into one's life. It is not merely intellectual assent or agreeing with an idea. It is incorporating truth into the very sinew and marrow and fiber of your existence. I was talking once with a student at the University of California in Berkeley, and I asked if he was interested in religion. He said, no, he wasn't. But then I asked if he was interested in seeking and finding the supreme values of human life, and his reply was he certainly was. But I said, isn't that precisely what religion is? Loyalty to the loftiest of ideals. If a person is true to the best he or she knows, that person will become true to God. And if a person seeks for supreme values, will eventually find the very source of all supreme values, the supreme being, and will find God as a father and friend. And the inward spiritual strength of that experience will endure through every problem and perplexity of life. The great poet, Robert Frost, began writing as a boy, but his abilities lay unrecognized. Year after year, he labored with his pen, writing and submitting his poems to publishers again and again, but to no avail. Yet he persisted. Through lean and bitter years, he composed. Of his six children, two died in infancy. The third shortly after marriage, the fourth became mentally ill, and the fifth, the son, committed suicide. Not until he was past 40 did Robert Frost begin to receive recognition for his work. But as the author C.P. Snow put it in his biography, somewhere at the lowest stratum of the shifting quicksands of his nature, there was rock. Great individuals meet and master tragedies and problems through sheer strength of spirit, and the message of the Master 2,000 years ago was that strength of spirit is available to every person who will seek it. Seek and you will find, he said. Knock and the door will be opened. Ask and you will receive. Then write to us, will you? At the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, there's a reason for your life. And haven't you always felt it? Haven't you always really known it inside? There's a reason for your existence. God has a will for you. I've written free literature on the spiritual life, on these very things, yours without cost, charge, or obligation, when you write to us at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644, United States of America. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Growing Spiritually, Seven Principles of Prayer, The Fatherhood of God, The Brotherhood of Man, Life After Death, What Happens to You When You Die, What Lies Beyond, all of this, yours with no cost, charge, or obligation when you write to us. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell out mailing address, Box 3080 Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, United States of America. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day.